subject in a robbery, like us to do, we set up the nav, get it up airborne. Airplane launch. affords me the opportunity to make decisions, to make correct decisions. It pro provides me priceless intelligence of the actual scene or structure that we're working at, uh, and it helps keep everybody safe. If they ever see the micro-air vehicle being used and they hear the noise signature that comes out, it's not a stealth technology in any way, shape, or form. So it's pretty, uh, pretty noticeable if it's flying around your neighborhood. I think you would be well aware of it. A high-tech military drone is causing a buzz at the Miami-Dade County Police Department. At the end of the day, it's about marketing your program. And the more you market it and market it in a positive way, the more support you're going to have overall from the entire community. Past several years, unmanned aircraft systems, or UAS for short, have become a popular military tool. Not only are they used by the U.S. military, but by more than 40 other nations as well. UAS are often called drones by the media, but they are not. The term drone implies something that flies without human input, such as the target drones used by the military. But the unmanned aircraft systems for law enforcement are controlled by a human operator flying the device line of sight. Throughout this video, interviewees will also use the term UAV for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle or MAV for Micro Air Vehicle. However, UAS or Unmanned Aircraft Systems is the currently accepted terminology. A bill signed into law by President Obama gives the Federal Aviation Administration until late 2015 to draft regulations that integrate unmanned aircraft systems into U.S. airspace. The commercial uses for UAS range from real estate companies, to the media, to land surveyors, to pipeline companies, and by farmers to survey their fields, apply seed, fertilizer, and insecticide to aid in the production of crops. However, the use of UAS in public safety has become quite an issue of its own. Unmanned aircraft systems show great promise when it comes to helping first responders look for lost hikers, surveying fire scenes, and probably most controversially, police work. Well, the FAA and the National Institutes of Justice got together and worked out what we now call the common strategy that allows us to uh, provide a way forward for a law enforcement or first responder organization to get through what was a daunting process of approval in a much more structured and stepwise manner that we believe any law enforcement agency could achieve. We did this by exchanging information between the FAA and the National Institute of Justice so we understood the needs of the law enforcement community and were able to tailor a process that would meet those needs and maintain the safety of the system. The process includes a first step which is an approval for the law enforcement or first responder to set up a training area where they can begin to operate their aircraft learn how to fly them, learn how to maintain them, and develop their procedures that will allow them to operate in their entire jurisdiction. And those procedures are key to that process. We expect them to have a method to establish an incident perimeter where they would keep folks out from danger from underneath the aircraft, and but would allow them to quickly respond to a situation that occurs that they have to deploy the aircraft for. This gives them the flexibility and maintains the safety of the system. Well, the Miami-Dade Police Department became involved in the UAVs program back in 2008. Took delivery in uh, July of 2009, and since that time we've been testing. Uh, all our personnel were trained in August of 2009. Uh, it's a 40-hour class put on by the manufacturer to train all the personnel. Uh, so a week-long class, they went out, do numerous flights, get their training up, and then after that, we, on our own as a department and a unit, decided to go out and train on a monthly basis. So we did that probably about a year and a half to two years before we, we continued in the process of getting certified. And that was a lengthy process at the time, with assistance from the FAA, obviously, and Honeywell, the manufacturer of the, pro of the product, coming out and giving us both uh, tech support, 
as well as support with the administrative side of it uh, to help us get through the uh, paperwork that needed to be done. So with all those efforts coming together, we were able to secure a uh, COA or, or um, certificate of authorization in t 2011 that allowed us to operate this thing on actual callouts. With an aviation unit inventory that includes four helicopters and two small aircraft, the MAV is an addition to Miami-Dade's aviation unit that fills a particular void. The UAV is a tool for our department to use uh, at, in variant uh, circumstances. For example, uh, flying a, uh, a helicopter or a fixed-wing aircraft is much more costly than flying a UAV. Uh, it also, depending on the safety, uh, situation, you may not want to put uh, an officer or pilot in harm's way, therefore you'd fly the UAV instead. Officer safety in this job is critical. Uh, obviously, I, as a commander, I do not deploy you know, to a forward position where I can get actual eyes on. With the MAV, it gives me the ability to stay back here at the Tactical Operation Command Center and actually see what my forward operators are seeing. So, as a commander, my job is to assist uh, my team leader that's forward, uh, remind him and give him recommendations or suggestions of things that would help him resolve that situation and keeping him and his officers safe. The one thing the MAV is not is a casually deployed device. Upon receiving a call or a request to utilize the UAV, first thing I need to do is see if it's an area that we're permitted to operate in. Have to make sure that it's an area that doesn't have controlled airspace or anything that would interrupt uh, safe operation. Second thing I need to do is contact the FAA uh, in Miami and make sure that they'll give me permission to fly. We're required by our certificate of authorization to notify them one hour prior to the use of the aircraft. So first thing I would do is notify them the location that we're planning on using it in and that we have intentions of using it. At that point, I also need to assemble my team and get them out there responding. Upon arrival, I want to make contact with the incident commander. I need to know where's a safe area or where he thinks a safe area for me to operate from and set up is. I also need to find out what exactly do we have so I know what type of information he's going to ask or need and where I'm heading, what direction we're, we're working in. Uh, once that's uh, established, we'll go ahead and find a safe area. If his area that he thinks he would like me to set up so we're close enough to provide information and support but far enough away that we won't have crowding in our, in our operation area, then we'll go ahead and use that. If we need to relocate, I'll look for a suitable area explain to them that we're relocating why and where we're going to be. In our early um, trials, we found that uh, what tends to happen is everyone seems to crowd around the area where the UAV is being operated from, where the pilot is, and immediately we realized we needed to go back to something very simple in aviation, which is a sterile cockpit. So what we did was we ended up uh, clearing that area, making someone responsible for maintaining the integrity of that area so the pilot can operate the aircraft and not be distracted. You know, in law enforcement, uh, many people may show up, including uh, upper uh, management, and they all want to see what's going on and all want to get involved. So what we found we had to do is take the um, video that was coming in from the UAV and actually send it to another location. So in this case, we set up a, a remote station for them to watch it on a TV screen, which was better than the little screen we were using on the laptop. So it really took all the people out of the cockpit area as we said. So now the pilot is concentrating, he has a sterile environment that's safe, he's not distracted, he doesn't have to worry about a supervisor or someone over his shoulder uh, giving him multiple commands or, or conflicting commands and he can just copy uh, the information that's given from a team leader with, from the aviation unit that's been embedded in the tactical operations center with the SRT commander. So the information flows from the SRT commander to an aviation unit uh, personnel supervisor directly to him and he responds back to him. So, the, so there's a little slight delay, but we're off a, we're on a separate frequency on a radio usually talking so that there's no interference with the operation that's taking place tactically and tactical is not interfering with the aviation operation. And it seems to alleviate a lot of the uh, problems of uh, congestion in that, in that pilot operating area. And as the operation is going forth, information is constantly flowing up and back. The SRT commander will let us know what he wants to see, if he wants uh, photographs of something or a video or a still photo, we have that ability to do that. So we're responsive to his needs, but yet we're still able to safely operate the UAV. Uh, these guys come out, they take 100% control uh, of that equipment, they fly that equipment, they maintain that equipment, and uh, basically it's, it's an asset that I have at my disposal as a tactical commander, and I ask them a question and I have a problem, you know, if it's something that I need from the scene, 
they put the Mav in the air and they get me the answer. So when you're talking about uh, receiving information that you don't have or that you other not, otherwise would not have as a tactical commander, um, that's priceless to me. Probably the biggest challenge the use of unmanned aircraft systems in law enforcement faces is the perception of some of the public that the devices will be used to conduct surveillance on them in their own backyards and homes. One of the most frequent questions we get regarding the use of the UAV or the micro air vehicle is privacy concerns. Uh, the average citizen is worried that we're using this to spy on them. We frequently get uh, Big Brother or other organizations touting that we're using this to spy on people. <laughs> I think the type of vehicle it is, the, the noise signature that it makes alleviates a lot of those concerns. In, in addition to that, our internal policy states that this is used in a very narrow set of circumstances. Our set of circumstances for using this is what we call a defined incident perimeter, basically a police action, a perimeter that's already taking place. There's already numerous police officers on the scene. We have a perimeter set up because of a known threat. We're not just taking this thing up, it's not being flown on patrol, it's not randomly going around neighborhoods looking at people and seeing what we see. It's only being deployed at a scene where we have an ongoing police activity. And this thing is driven to the scene, launched from within the, in that perimeter, recovered from in time that, that perimeter as well. So it's never flying over people's neighborhoods looking at things. So I, that alleviates, I think, a lot of concern. The policies that we have in place is to only use this in those type of situations to support our tactical teams, our SRT or a SWAT team. Transparency, especially in, in today's world, is the best key. I mean, short of there being some type of information uh, that for law enforcement sensitive reasons you have to uh, restrict, there's, there's nothing about the program uh, in general that the public can't know. So to, to sort of put out the fires of any concerns, the more information you put out there, the more you inform the community, the much more they're going to accept and actually support the program as you're, as you're developing it. Um, most, most media outlets uh, not only are willing to work with you, but rather support what you're doing because they understand that thanks to the work that you're doing as a law enforcement uh, official, that they're going to enhance, uh, they're going to enhance whatever, uh, their purpose is, whether it's, uh, you know, capturing an incident as it's occurring or getting a follow-up story. So if, if you have any concerns, if you're trying to get your message across, I would recommend that you invite the media over, um, convey to them what it is you're trying to do, and, and answer as many questions as you possibly can to get the information out there. I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to share with the public the true benefits of using unmanned aircraft and how they can help ensure their safety and help to uh, find lost individuals quickly, help to resolve incidents quickly and safely for the, for the law enforcement. But I do believe that that privacy issue is probably the biggest one we all face. And it's an, ed an issue of education, in my opinion, not an issue of any sort of uh, laws or policies that need to be changed. It is said that experience is the best teacher. A lot can be learned from those who have been through the process and Miami-Dade's experiences can help kickstart other departments' plans to start unmanned aircraft systems programs. One of the first things that an agency interested in the UAV program should do is identify what's their mission, what's their purpose for the program. We get phone calls all the time from different agencies and their intent for the program varies. We've had departments that call and say, well, we, we uh, patrol rural areas that we can't get to by foot and it's easier if we would just deploy an aircraft. Well, knowing some of the hurdles we went through and what our certificate of authorization actually allows us to do, uh, right there, it, it sort of refocuses what their intent should be because they know that uh, as of the moment, you cannot fly the UAV uh, farther than eyesight. So if, if you can't see it, you're not going to be able to fly it. I, I would recommend to any law enforcement agency that is uh, considering a UAV program to contact other agencies that are either in the uh, planning stages or actually have a program in place. You can come call our department, call any department out there. Most, most folks that are participating in the program are going to be very open to sharing the information with you. If you have an opportunity, get as much information as you can. If you can visit the actual agency, visit them. I'd also recommend that they contact the FAA 
find out. I mean, I think that that was one of our biggest uh, uh, pluses was being able to work with the FAA while we were training. Those two years we were developing the program allowed us to not only develop the standard operating procedures, but overall mold the program to what the FAA wanted to see the program uh, become. That made things a lot easier when it came down to getting the certificate of authorization. So I would recommend definitely contact the other agencies, contact the FAA, start training with it, even if you don't have the program in place, as soon as you can get the equipment. And with, with the blessing of the FAA and of, their, of the individual department, it'll just speed up the process as it gets into the application and actual uh, fruition stage of it. We're also closely collaborating with the Department of Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate on their efforts to assist in the common strategy. One of the issues that most law enforcement agencies have is that they're responsible for declaring the, their vehicle to be airworthy. However, they have no resources, no expertise in determining the airworthiness of an aircraft for their use. So that's where uh, John Appleby's organization comes in with their testing that's going on in the Oklahoma City area, where they are evaluating at the request of the manufacturers their aircraft for suitability for use by law enforcement and first responders. That is a key aspect of the common strategy approach that will continue our collaboration with the National Institutes of Justice to achieve what we hope will be widespread use of unmanned aircraft in the law enforcement and first responder communities. I envision the future of the program expanding far greater than it is today. We're still in the preliminary stages of what we can do with the program. We've only had the certificate of authorization to fly it since uh, 2011. Right now we currently are restricted to flying it during daytime hours, restricted to a uh, specific airspace. And there's been several instances where we've had an opportunity to deploy, but because the area doesn't meet what the uh, COA allows us to fly, we've had to pass on the opportunity to fly it. So a as the uh, program evolves, we like to be able to use it during nighttime hours so we can make use, better use of our FLIR camera, which is uh, one of the cameras available to our UAVs. We'd also like to use it in uh, other airspaces uh, because a large portion of our county is in Class B airspace, which we are restricted from using it. Making use of new technology brings on many benefits and new challenges. The situational awareness provided by the sensors and cameras on unmanned aircraft systems help keep law enforcement personnel safe. The challenges, if thoughtfully approached, can be overcome. Learning from those who have been through the process can be priceless. You go ahead and make entry. Make entry. Okay, SRT is making entry. So, get Yes, all area clear. Get one subject in custody. 